Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. The case that I'm going to look into today is the murder of Kirsten Costas who was a 15 year old teenager who was actually murdered by one of her classmates who was jealous of her. There's no other reason other than that. I'd just like to let you know I mean no disrespect to anyone I talk about today. I've just gathered this information off the internet and compiled it into a video for educational purposes. Kirsten Marina Costas was born on the 23rd of July in 1968 to parents Arthur and Berit Costas in Oakland, California in the US. She also had a brother called Peter and they grew up in a very small suburb town called Orinda. Kirsten was a very pretty, popular and very, very intelligent young girl. Her family were doing really well for themselves and they lived in this really well off area and Kirsten seemingly had it all. Kirsten attended Miramonte High School and there she would go on to kind of excel. She would go into all of these groups and these swim teams and sport teams and anything. Like she was in a lot of these sport groups and things like that. She did really well for herself there. She was just very versatile in what she wanted to do and she did all these different things and loads of people liked her. She was a very popular girl and people kind of gravitated towards her because of that. She was, like I said, she was just a lovely girl. This high school was a very good high school. People came out with top end grades and not only that, they like I said, they had all these sports things and they would actually produce these athletes that would go on to the NFL and things like that. So they were, that school was a really good school to go to, but also it was a very competitive environment because of the parents of those children like always did really well. And so the kids felt like they needed to follow in their footsteps and the entire place was just very, very competitive. So the school was quite affluent and Kirsten absolutely loved it. As I said, she was really popular. She was a very talented girl and so she just thrived in that environment. It was June and Kirsten had just finished her sophomore year. She had actually been sort of selected to become a cheerleader the next year that she came into school, which was a really good honor for them. All the girls wanted to be a cheerleader. And as I said, it was so competitive. So they were all kind of clambering on top of each other to try and get the best social status there and just be in the best clubs that they could. Kirsten kind of hang out, hang out with a group of friends that were in the same state as her. They were popular, they were pretty, they were intelligent. And then all of them received this invite to join a group called the Bobber Links, or it was otherwise known as the Bobbies. Now the Bobbies was the best of the best group in a sense. And one of the students actually stated that if you didn't fit in with sort of them, then you would not be invited. They only invite certain people and they actually described them as kind of being snobbish. It was kind of like a sorority in a sense and it was kind of the most popular kids that would only be able to join this group. As I said, like it being like a sorority, they had an initiation where they'd get you to do weird things like, I don't know, putting egg in your hair or on one time they got somebody to get their mother's oldest clothes, go outside and to sell kisses on the street. And obviously once you do those things of your initiation, you then get into the bobbies. It was something that most girls wanted. Most girls wanted to be in the bobbies. Not everyone, of course, not everyone's like that. You know, there's some girls out there that didn't want to be in there, didn't like the popular scene and all that lot. But a lot of girls that wanted to be popular, they wanted to be in the bobbies and so did Kirsten. So she was excited to become a cheerleader. She was excited to be invited to the bobbies. She was just doing really well for herself in school and she was just absolutely loving life. So at the beginning of the year, the Bobbies would gather together kind of a new intake of members and the ones that were invited that year included Kirsten Costas, her friends Lauren Shea and Bernadette Pratty. And they were all going to be joining the Bobbies together, which would have been great because they were all friends. And once they would have completed their initiation, whatever they would have made them do, obviously we, they didn't know yet, but it was along those lines of people know what sororities make people do. So it can be strange sometimes, but it's in their eyes a show of their dedication. And so they do it. And once they were done, they'd get in the bobbies and they'd become this elite popular goddess, so to speak. Two weeks into summer vacation, Kirsten gets a phone call. Her mother answers the phone and takes the message. But basically there's this girl on the other end of the phone telling her that Kirsten has been invited to the initiation dinner for the bobbies. They said that they're gonna pick her up on Saturday and take her and then obviously take her back home when she's ready. They also said that obviously all the bobbies were gonna be there, all the new intakes were gonna be there, 
But she didn't want her to tell anyone else about it, so she had to keep her mouth shut about it, basically. On the 23rd of June in 1984, Kirsten left her home. She went out to attend this initiation dinner. Now, a little while later, there's some disturbing sounds heard on the street. So her neighbour, a man called Arthur Hillman, heard a scream outside on the street. He ran outside to go and see what was going on, and he sees Kirsten kind of stood near his door, and then she just collapsed in front of him. She was covered in blood, she was on the floor now, and she was bleeding profusely from multiple stab wounds. She was bleeding out um, very, very quickly. So he gets his son to ring 911 as he's trying to stem the ble bleeding as best as he could. He's just trying to help out this poor 15 year old girl. As he's trying to help Kirsten, he looks up and he sees this Volvo driving away from the scene. And obviously that's suspicious. So he makes some kind of a mental note of it and carries on trying to help Kirsten. He also asked her like who had done it and unfortunately she couldn't answer. She was really struggling to breathe at that point and she was just gasping for breath so she couldn't get any words out. The ambulances arrived along with her parents who had actually been out that night. They'd been out all evening, I guess just enjoying themselves, being together, enjoying each other's company and to come home to that, your daughter on the street basically dying must have just been horrendous after enjoying such a nice evening it just must have been so devastating but as much as the paramedics tried to help and they worked on Kirsten there was nothing that they could do and unfortunately she did pass away so now this was a homicide case someone had stabbed Kirsten and left the scene but who within hours the entire place was cordoned off the police the ambulances everyone was there and obviously Arthur became like the star witness. He was there, he saw pretty much most of what had gone on. He told them everything, including the Volvo. So he's describing the car, how it drove away. And then suddenly the Volvo just drives back up into the crime scene, pulls over and he's like, well, that's the car, that's the Volvo. That's what I'm talking about. So the driver gets out and comes over and speaks to the police. This guy was called Alex Arnold and he actually lived in the next town over. Now, funnily enough, even though his car was seen fleeing the scene, seemingly, he was more of a witness than anything else. So that was when the kind of events of the day began to unfold a little bit. So basically, he was at home with his friends in the next town over, as I said, and they were playing some sort of card game. And then suddenly he gets this knock on the door. When he opens the door, there's a teenage girl stood there asking for his help and it was Kirsten. She was very distressed. She wanted to use his phone basically to call her parents because her friend that she was with had started acting weird and she didn't feel safe anymore. So she basically jumped out of the car and his went to the first house that she saw and that was his. And so she wanted to call her parents. He let her in, he let her use the phone. Obviously this was the eighties, mobile phones didn't exist then. So, the only way to contact people was obviously through the home line and so she called but as I said before her parents weren't in so there was no answer. Now being a nice guy and seeing that she was frightened and distressed he offered to give her a ride home and she accepted. So she was really scared and she was really really didn't feel safe and this guy had offered her a ride home to allow her to get home safe safely hopefully if only that was the case. As Alex reversed out of his drive, he noticed this beat up old yellow Pinto sort of behind. And as he drives away, he also realizes that it is following him. So he asks Kirsten if she knows who this car was and she just says, oh, don't worry about it. And so they take the journey back home to Kirsten's house with this yellow car following her all the way. When Kirsten got home, as I said, her parents weren't in. So she pretty much planned to go to her neighbors and asked them to walk her to a doorstep. As I said, she was scared, she didn't feel safe. And Alex said that he would wait in the car pretty much until she got in the house, until she was with someone and he knew that she was safe, he would wait and watch over her and that's what he did. But what happened next was really, really tragic because she didn't get into the house safe. As Alex is sat there in the car watching her, waiting for her to get to the door, she approaches the neighbor house, neighbor's house and she doesn't really get very far at all actually and when someone approaches her. The driver gets out of the yellow Pinto, walks towards her and basically attacks her. Alex said the attacker was a teenage girl. Kirsten began shouting at her saying, you're a weirdo, go away, leave me alone, things like that. But the girl just carried on walking towards her. 
When she got close, she attacked her. Now the thing was, she was actually carrying a knife. Now from Alex's point of view, he sees this teenage girl get out of the car, run towards Kirsten, and he doesn't see the knife. So from his view, all he sees is this girl attack Kirsten. He believes that it is with her fists, that she's punching her or something like that. And he just thought they were fighting, but they actually weren't. Kirsten was being stabbed over and over. The attack didn't last very long before the girl ran away, got back into the car and drove off. Now Alex, assuming that Kirsten had just been in a fist fight and that she wasn't really badly injured, he didn't see the knife like I said. So he thought his best plan of action would be to go after the driver, to follow this car and obviously try and nail who had just attacked her. So he just witnessed an assault and he wanted to help. So that's what he does. He drives off in pursuit of the yellow pinto and that is when the neighbor sees him driving off thinking that the volvo was involved when it wasn't seemingly involved so he goes he follows this car for a little while and eventually he loses her he decides to return back to the scene to obviously check on kirsten to make sure that she's all right and that is when he comes back to the crime scene that's been fully cordoned off the police are all there. Now, of course, the police were suspicious of him. You would be. So he's the only witness of it is seeing the car fleeing away and it was his car. But they checked his alibi. As I said, he was playing crabs or other card games with his friends and they all corroborated that story. They corroborated that, yes, this girl knocked on the door and he offered to give her a lift home. So he was ruled out as a suspect and then he became a witness rather than a suspect. He described her attacker as being a chunky teenage girl with stringy blonde hair, wearing tracksuit pants and driving the yellow beetle pinto. Now, even though they had this description, the problem with it was, was that what one person classes as chunky, maybe another person doesn't class as chunky. So his interpretation of this teenage girl being chunky may not have been, and people's views differ. And so, Yes, okay, they had this sort of slim description, but it still left a wide net for sort of people to be suspects in. At around 2am that night, which was hours after Kirsten's death, her parents were actually interviewed. Her mum, Berit, said that she took a call. She had all the information as far as she knew. Her daughter was going out to this Bobby's initiation dinner and that everyone would be there. Now, the police obviously looked into this dinner. They called around all the Bobbies. They called around... The people that were being initiated into the bobbies and not one of them knew about any dinner so basically it was a lie it was a ruse to lure her out of the house now it must have been someone that knew kirsten well enough to be able to use this as a ruse because they knew that if they rang and said the bobbies were having an initiation dinner you're invited to come along on saturday they knew that she would go so they must have known her at least even a little bit and she was excited to be part of the Bobbies, so of course she was going to go. And she just assumed that it was real. You would do. No one would think that it was a ruse and that it was all a ploy to get her out of the house. Nobody would think that. Unfortunately, even though the call was very important to the case, they can't do anything like track it in them days. So yes, they had this call off a teenage girl about this fake dinner, but it didn't really lead anywhere because they weren't able to trace it or anything like that. So they had to focus on other avenues, which they then focused on the car this beat up yellow pinto now they didn't have like a registration plate for it they ended up compiling a list of pretty much 500 cars of slightly different colors even and models that were similar because as i said people's opinions differ so some people see colors differently maybe it wasn't yellow or maybe it was just a slightly off color so they had to have a very wide range of colors obviously they don't have to be purple but you know what I mean? And they had cars that were of a similar brand that could look similar because maybe they this Alex made a mistake and maybe the brand of the car wasn't even a Pinto. So basically they had to check a lot of cars and the description again didn't really narrow down the search. They began working their way through the list and trying to track down each and every car and look into it. Now the morning after the murder, news broke to the town and everyone was really, really shocked. No one ever really thinks that it'll happen to them. No one ever thinks that their town could be harboring a murderer. You always, a lot of towns like that, a lot of smaller towns think you know everyone and you see it a lot in cases where they say, we all look after each other, we all knew each other and 
you can never truly know someone. That's the thing with these things. You find a lot in these cases that there are murderers out there and they could be your next door neighbor and you just don't know. You could think you know someone and you never truly do, unfortunately. So they assumed really that it wasn't actually anyone in their community and that it must have been someone passing by because as I said, no one in their community could commit murder. But in a lot of these cases, they can and they are very capable and you just don't know. So now there's a murderer possibly in town and possibly in your community, possibly your next door neighbor. And rightly so, people were terrified. Parents were frightened for their children. And so they made them go out in pairs and, and even threes, just basically more than one of you when you traveled because they were scared that something was gonna happen to them and rightly so. There had literally been a cold blooded murder right in the middle of the street in front of potentially a lot of people and a teenager lost a life because of it. Of course, you're gonna be terrified for your safety, others' safety, your children's safety. It's just a given. So the people began interviewing close to home. They began interviewing the pupils in her school and things like that. As I said, they knew that it was a teenage girl. And so they began interviewing everyone in her friend circle, just the pupils everywhere. I believe they interviewed around a hundred girls, asking them where they were during the murder and just trying to see if they had any motives to do this to Kirsten. They found out a few things. So they found out that Bernadette Prati, which was Kirsten's friend, hadn't actually made it to the cheerleading team whereas Kirsten did, and potentially that could have been a motive. So she could have been jealous of her and it could be the reasoning behind wanting to murder her. Not only that, Kirsten and her friend Ashley had apparently pranked a lot of people, sort of less popular children. And so possibly one of those had taken it too far. They'd gotten angry at being pranked and so they wanted to get back at her and maybe that was a motive. It also came out that Lauren, one of Kirsten's friends was also on the swim team with her and that they were arguing a lot so maybe her murder could have been a result of that but apparently lauren did go on to state that they had no problems they were just obviously they were still really good friends so there were a lot of kind of potential motives but they didn't really find anything else along the lines of anyone looking suspicious or anything like that one of the one of the members of the bobbies actually came forward and said that they th they theorized that Kirsten was targeted because of what she symbolized. Maybe this person didn't like everything in the community that she symbolized the bobbies, the popularity, I don't know, anything like that. And maybe they didn't like it. And so that is why they targeted her. And it's not that out there that theory really because the bobbies were like this elite force in school. They had it all and they were kind of stuck up themselves. So maybe someone did target her as a representative of all of that. So all these rumors began spreading. It was quite a small town and everyone was talking about who possibly killed her. The community spread the word of the killer's description that was given out and they were also trying to raise a reward for any information that could be given towards the case. The police did, really didn't have very much to go on and all they could do was just keep questioning people. So as they carried on digging deeper into people's lives and into Kirsten's life, they actually found that maybe Kirsten was attacked as more of a personal attack rather than as a representative of the Bobbies and popularity. Kirsten was described as being very outspoken and she always said things how they were and sometimes people don't like that. She was also described as being condescending and very mean at times. She was very dismissive and she'd often talk about people behind their backs and that is why their thought pattern changed because maybe one of these people that she talked behind her backs about had gotten angry or something and attacked her for it. As I said, with all the rumors and things, people really, really brought their brains to figure out who hated Kirsten enough to want to attack her. And there was one name that kept popping up and that was Nancy Crane. Now, originally Nancy was part of the popular kids group. She was involved in all of that and then she hung out with a group, with Kirsten, with the girls. In her sophomore year, Nancy changed, decided that she wanted to change her ways. She didn't want to be a stuck up popular kid anymore. She didn't want any part of that and she just wanted to do her own thing. And then Kirsten and the popular girls became like the symbolization of the, all the things she didn't really like. She didn't respect them because of how they acted. And in Nancy's eyes, at least, Kirsten represented everything that she didn't want to be a part of anymore. She hated everything about them. And to the point where she actually wrote in a notebook, I want to see her blood drip. So people really, really were suspicious of Nancy. Things weren't looking really good for her. As her name began flying around, the police actually questioned her. 
she told them that she'd gone to the, the cinema that night to watch the film Ghostbusters and the police thought she was lying. They asked her parents if they could perform a lie detector test on her a polygraph and they denied it and that does look suspicious because there were so many other girls that had actually just taken this test without an issue so why were her parents not letting Nancy take it? On the 4th of September which was just a month after Kirsten's attack it was the first day back of school and guess who wasn't there to attend? You guessed it, Nancy. So everyone really really assumed that she definitely did it. This really threw the suspicion heavily on her by her pupils at school and they really thought she was hiding something. She actually never went to school that day because something was weighing heavy on her and she'd actually gone to the police station instead to confess something. Now she was lying about something but it wasn't that she had murdered Kirsten. What she was lying about was she didn't actually go to the cinema that day, she never watched the film because she had gone to her boyfriend's instead and spent the time with him and she didn't want her parents to find out so that is why she lied. The police went on to check her alibi with her boyfriend and it checked out, that's where she was and so she was cleared of a sus as a suspect. This once more put a case at kind of a standstill again. As I said the police had very little to go on anyway and their main sort of lead who they really thought it was has now just been cleared. At this point they had gone through over a thousand leads and interviewed around about 300 people but nothing ever really panned out in the case and they weren't any closer to figuring out who had done it. Because of that they reached out to the FBI. As I said they were really struggling and they needed some assistance so the FBI assigned an agent called Bob Gass to the case and he decided that he was gonna do a psychological profile on this killer. And that was actually a fairly new thing at the time so he was gonna pull out all the stops for this case and put everything they had into it. From these psychological profiles you can actually learn a lot about people and it's actually pretty remarkable because you can just learn so much about the suspects and I don't even know how they manage it. So they managed to do things like from the murder weapon that was used you can kind of get a motive from it. Things like a knife is more of an angered frenzied attack. It's more like a targeted attack that you have to get in there close, you have to put force behind it, you have to put effort in, more effort than standing back and pulling a trigger. It's kind of more personal and more angry. So basically the person that did this had a lot of anger towards Kirsten. Three months passed by and this profile is finally ready. Now again I have no idea how they do this and if you know please enlighten me because I would love to learn and figure that out but they found out a lot of stuff about their suspect. So they found out that this, that she was from a Catholic family, that she was one of six children, so part of a big family, that she didn't really feel guilt over the murder and would probably not confess to it because of sort of feeling guilty like a lot of people do, that they were most likely the same age as Kirsten and probably a friend of the victims amongst all these other things that they found out. So the police took the FBI profile and they ran it against Kirsten's friends. It was then, six months after Kirsten's murder, that they found a match. Bernadette Prati. She came from a very large Catholic family. She was 15 or so, the same age as Kirsten, and she was also one of her friends. To those around her, they thought Bernadette wasn't capable of killing anyone, and it definitely wasn't her. She was also kind, non-threatening. She seemingly mourned Kirsten with everyone else. She went to a funeral and even when she was questioned by the police again she was very calm, she was very cooperative and even the police began to doubt that this profile was correct, that she could have been the killer. She also had taken a polygraph, she'd passed that, but of course they aren't foolproof and they would have been even worse then so even now, like nearly 40 years later, they're not admissible in court so just think how probably bad they would have been then but she took that, she passed it regardless but she took it, she passed it even though that's not to say that she didn't commit this murder just because she passed it. Either way she came across as thoughtful, she was seemingly truthful and she was actually dismissed as a suspect because of it. Even though they dismissed her as a suspect, the police, it didn't really sit well with the police. I guess they wanted to do one last check because this profile fitted her perfectly and so by all accounts it must have been her right? So 
in their eyes, they just wanted to doubly make sure because they just didn't want to dismiss her and then leave it at that and just move on. So they search the house one last time. During the search, they look in the garage and guess what they find in the garage? A beat up old yellow Pinto. Now Bernadette didn't have a driving license and she claimed to have never driven this car before. That doesn't mean that she didn't, of course. But this was when they looked into our alibi more. As I said, they looked into so many people, I guess they hadn't checked everybody's alibi. She seemed truthful, she seemed legit, and there was nothing really that pointed too much towards her. So they must have never checked her alibi because when they did, she said that she was babysitting that night. They called the couple that she was babysitting for and they said that they hadn't used her services in over a year. So she was lying about where she was that night. The police brought her in for what would now be her fifth interview and they still didn't have any evidence to say that she had actually done it so they were aiming to get a confession off her. These investigator grilled her over and over and she didn't break once. They really thought she would break down. She was a 15 year old girl. Surely she would break. Surely she would admit to what she'd done. But she didn't. She remained calm and cool and collected all the way throughout the interview. She never showed any signs of cracking whatsoever. They showed her the FBI profile and told her that it matches her perfectly. And she said, well, do you think I did it? To which the officer responded, yeah, I think you did. But she still kept to a story. She was fine. She did not break. She just said that she had nothing to do with Kirsten's murder. A couple of days later, she wrote a letter to her parents and she told her mom not to read it until 30 minutes after she left. And her mother did. Her mother set an alarm and when the buzzer went off, she opened the letter and she began to read the contents. Within this note, she wrote, the FBI man thinks I did it and he's right. Her parents were obviously horrified by this revelation. They would never assume that their 15 year old little girl was ever capable of doing something like that. But here she was admitting to it. They went out and found her straight away and they took her to the police station. And that is where she finally broke down and confessed to the murder of Kirsten Costas. It was the first time that she had ever showed any emotion over what she had done. Everyone was shocked and nobody really thought that she would be capable of doing something like that. And again, I've said it so many times and I'll say it so many times more. You never truly know what people are capable of. You never truly know them. And that is awful because Bernadette was supposed to be Kirsten's friend and she stabbed her to death. And just, you just never assume that your friends would do something like that ever. But it happens, unfortunately. Three months pass by and the trial begins and she just admits to everything and she admits what happened. She did make up the initiation dinner for the Bobbies, knowing that Kirsten would come out of the house for it. She called Kirsten's mum, she lied about it all and in the police interview she admits to everything that happened. That night she drove the car out, obviously without a license, she didn't have a license to drive the car but she drove the car out, car out. she went to pick Kirsten up and Probably at some point during the car journey, Kirsten realised that the dinner was a fake. Now, they were a town over and they got into an argument about something which we don't know tr truly what it was about. Even though Bernadette was one of the popular girls, it seems like she really relied on Kirsten's approval for her own happiness. She really struggled with her self-esteem and I read somewhere that on one occasion, just to kind of highlight how much she relied on Kirsten. She once joked about some shoes that Bernadette was wearing and that then put her in this really horrible mood for days and she ended up throwing these shoes out because Kirsten didn't like them so she got rid of them. So that just goes to show how much she kind of relied on approval for herself pretty much and how much it would affect her mood if she didn't get her approval. As I said, she was miserable for days because Kirsten didn't like her shoes. So that year in particular, Bernadette hadn't made it onto the yearbook committee like Kirsten had. She also didn't make it into the cheerleading squad like Kirsten had. Kirsten just seemed to fit right in, like without any hassle. She just slotted in everywhere and just, 
she fit everywhere and Bernadette just seemingly didn't. She struggled more with it and it was thought that that really took a toll on her and she was just really jealous of Kirsten because of it. So Kirsten, rightly so, wasn't happy that she'd been lured out holding these false pre pretenses by Bernadette. And maybe that's what they argued about that day. Either way, it ended up with Kirsten calling Bernadette weird to her face and getting out of the car because Bernadette was apparently acting really strange and as I said earlier, she didn't feel safe. They were in the next town over, she gets out, she goes to the first door she sees and that is Alex's. She knocks on and obviously you know the rest from there. So she lied in wait outside and when she saw Kirsten getting Alex's car and him reversing, she panicked because she relied on this sense of everyone liking her and Kirsten now thought she was a weirdo and so she was really really worried that Kirsten would then go back home and tell everyone else that she was a weirdo and so she couldn't have that so she panicked and followed them back home. She thought that everything had gone wrong. Now she did claim that this murder wasn't premeditated but the 12 inch butcher knife that she took with her kind of says otherwise. Her sister Virginia Varela did actually testify that she had left the knife in the car. Now she used to use this 12 inch butcher knife to cut up fruit as she was on her journey which seems a bit excessive in my eyes at least like you don't need to use a butcher knife to cut up fruit now it could have been true or she could have been trying to cover up for a sister in a sense to try and lessen it to make it look like it wasn't premeditated obviously we don't know and you can take that how you want i just don't feel like you need such a knife to be cutting up fruit and vegetables but there you go i also know that kirsten's family didn't believe that either so again take it how you will three days later bernadette Pratty was found guilty of the second degree murder of kirsten costas now that just gets right under my skin straight away because she literally took that knife out with the intention of causing kirsten harm i don't understand why she didn't get first degree murder for that even if she hadn't put the knife in there and it was her sister's, she grabbed it as she's going to confront Kirsten. And I just, I don't get it. I'm not going to get too much into that. Because she was 16 years old at the time of her sentencing, the maximum sentence that she could have received was nine years. Now, she served just over seven of those years before she was released. And again, I personally don't really think that's enough. It's obviously just my opinion, but she took a life. She callously stabbed her to death in the street out of nothing more than jealousy. And it was her friend. She went out and she stabbed her friend to death and only served seven, just over seven years for that, which, wow. When you read into this case and research it, if that FBI profile wasn't ever actually made, maybe she would have never been caught. That was the prime reason as to why she was suspected. And even then, when they interviewed her, they still didn't think it was her because she was just cool as a cucumber and didn't show any signs of anything that it could be her. And they actually ruled her out as a suspect, which is insane. I don't know how a 15 year old girl can just be that brazen to just not crack under the pressure. Like she had murdered this teenage girl and she was being interviewed for it multiple times and she never cracked. Obviously she did eventually when they she wrote the letter, but I mean, in the interviews and things, she just didn't show any signs of it. And that was a result of, of the profile. I just don't understand how she could have been put herself forward as being so genuine and just managed to put on this act and fool everyone. I found this case really, really sad as they all are. Kirsten was just going about her life. She was enjoying it. She was doing really well for herself and she was brutally murdered because of her jealous friend. Now we've all been jealous before but that doesn't mean we go out murdering people because of it. But yeah, that's the end of the case. If you guys have any suggestions you'd like me to look into, let me know and I'll look into them for you. Give me a big thumbs up if you've enjoyed the video and subscribe to my channel if you like this content, similar content, and you can check out my other videos. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the case of Kirsten Costas. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.